In this video, I'm going to give you my predictions for UFC Vegas 95. As always, you can call me Kunith. Let's make some money this week. But real quick, before we do, just have to address that last week, not good. Six for 13 on the card, thought the dogs would bark. The dogs didn't bark. Only one dog barked and she was a tiny dog and you can argue she probably shouldn't have barked. We didn't get crushed from a betting perspective. We were able to do a little damage control there on the website, but still going six for 13, unacceptable really. And you guys know me, we're gonna own up to it. Then we dial it in and we have a strong week. So let's get it clean sweep loading. At the top of the card, we have heavyweights in the main, which feels strange because this is in the apex and we don't have women's flyweight at the top of the card, but we have some big boys moving around in there and it should be fun odds for this one pretty close money's been coming in on sergey spivak since it's opened as a pick -em, and i can understand why the dude's 29 years old while martin tibor is pushing 40. he's been learning on the job at the highest level as well which is something you really like to see spent more than half of his professional career in the ufc joins the promotion at only 24 years old 100 finish rate undefeated all the hotness and then he runs into walt harris and loses picks up a win in his second fight but then in his third fight he meets martin tibor and he loses that fight as well. So things weren't looking so good, but he has turned it around since then. But in that first fight between these two, Tybora was in control basically the whole time. Too physical for him, owned the clinch, took Spivak down, racked up nearly eight and a half minutes of control time. It was a true veteran performance against a young guy who was still developing. And I have to imagine that that fight is what's keeping this line from being out of control, keeping this line from Sergey Spivak being an even bigger favorite than he is. There's that and there's Tybora having the cardio edge given that he's had had more cage time. Tybor historically has good takedown defense and he can wrestle offensively, which could make all the difference here like it did in the first fight. Plus, when you start to look at Sergey Spivak's run in the UFC, he's winning against guys that he's supposed to be. He beats Tai Tuivasa, who offers nothing on the mat. Carlos Felipe, who's no longer in the UFC. Jared Vandera, who's no longer in the UFC. Caught a 43-year-old Alexei Olenek. Greg Hardy, who's no longer in the UFC and is getting knocked out in boxing matches every six weeks. Augusto Sakai, who's no longer in the UFC and Derek Lewis, who's the knockout king, big respect, but he really phoned that one in when Sergey Spivak was securing that first takedown. He got the clinch and it was a wrap. Lewis was getting back up to his feet, but also did nothing. Zero strikes landed for the Black Beast in that fight. So when you say it like that, especially with how bad Sergey Spivak looked in his last fight against Cyril Gaon, where he was just stuck in neutral, you might start to see some value with Marcin Tybora, who over the last couple of years has only lost to the best heavyweights on the roster, guys like Tom Aspinall, Alexander Volk, so for me, at first glance, I'm looking at this fight thinking, I think that there's value on the dog and Marcin Tybora, but I still like Sergey Spivak to get it done here, and I don't put too much stock in that first fight. It was pretty one-sided, yes, but it was also very early in the career of Sergey Spivak, plus he was weighing in in that fight at 234 pounds. In his last few matches, he's weighed north of 255 pounds, so he's gotten, as the kids would say, dummy thick lately, and that's going to serve him well in this fight if he's going to be in top position. It's not like it was a couple of years ago where he was given up serious mass. He's probably going to be the bigger guy this time around. And how much can we expect from Marcin Tybora if Sergey Spivak is able to take him down? I actually think Spivak does to Tybora what Tybora did to him in the first fight. Dominate the clinch, take him down, rack up some control time, but I don't think the fight lasts this long. I think if Sergey Spivak wins, it's going to be inside the first two rounds. I think Spivak gets on top. I think he lands heavy ground and pound, which could end the fight there, or he finds himself getting a submission. Give me the younger man to get it done this week to not up the series. Give me Sergey Spivak to win inside the distance. One thing I like about Sergey Spivak this week is the betting line. Now, if you got in a bit early, you would have gotten better line. It's gone a bit wide, but you can still get a line on him over at XBet. They are sponsoring today's video. It's another place for you to be able to get action down, do a little bit of line shopping. And here's the thing about Sergey Spivak. If you're a new customer and you load up XBet, it's going to look just like this. They can match your first deposit. Rollover rates do apply, but it's only one X. So it's not crazy like it is at some other books. But anyway, this is what XBet's going to look like for you. You can come down here and notice that Sergey Spivak right here is minus 154. And here's the thing. With the way Sergey Spivak fights and with the way this fight can go, if he does win, he's going to look like a minus 500 in there. And you're going to be stuck thinking, damn, I wish I had some Sergey Spivak because he just cut through this guy because that's what it looks like when Sergey Spivak's getting these Ws. So you don't want to sit there in hindsight and realize that minus 154 seemed like the easiest button you can click all week. So I do think that Sergey Spivak goes out there, gets it done. I like his price playable up to minus 250 in my opinion. I think he's got Marcin Tybor covered almost everywhere. Again, you can find that over at XBet. That'll be linked in the description. And it's not just for MMA betting. You can bet on damn near 
everything. You can also play in their online casino. So you could play a little pocket poker instead of pocket pool because I'm watching some of you and Santa is too. Next, we're looking at a fight between Chepe Mariscal. He's fighting Damon Jackson this week. Gritty fighters on both sides. This one should be a war. I think it goes the whole 15, but I think these guys let it all hang out. Chepe and Jackson have both proven that they will fight for your money damn near every time. And the line for this one has Mariscal at minus 240-ish at the time of recording this, and I would have to agree. I've enjoyed watching Damon Jackson get his hand raised over the years after that win over Mursad Bekdik. Big fan. The dude's a grinder. He sticks to you like glue. Has produced some big moments in the UFC, but bad matchup this week. Bad, bad matchup. Chepe Mariscal is going to be the better striker. He's going to land with a bit more power, and he's not going to fade or wilt under that Jackson pressure, which we've seen other guys do. That's the kind of guy that Damon Jackson beats. Chepe Mariscal is not. He has a ton of momentum starting his UFC career at 3-0, and and the odds makers are noticing that as well. He hasn't been this big of a favorite since coming into the UFC, and he is now because he's very clearly the side. And for those of you that don't know, if you've just noticed him in the UFC prior to coming to the UFC, this dude's fought everybody. Gregor Gillespie, the best fisherman in MMA, Bryce Mitchell, Carl Deaton III, who made it to the UFC, Yusuf Salal, and if you guys don't know, I am Yusuf Salal's fan club. It's me. I'm, I'm number one fan. Pat Sabatini, Joe Anderson Brito, Steve Garcia, and you have to consider this. There are plenty of men out there who wanted to be UFC fighters one day, and their plans were foiled, dreams crushed, because they ran into a guy on the regional scene who would eventually be UFC caliber. They got unlucky, they got matched up with whoever that was, and they thought, nope, this ain't for me. No, this guy just beat the brakes off of me, I'm good. So for Chepe to have seen so many extremely talented dudes early in his career on his way up while he's trying to make a name for himself, with mixed results, mind you, he's winning some of these fights, speaks to the mental fortitude, the dude won't be broken. Again, the leech beats guys when he breaks them. I don't think that happens this week. So give me Chepe and Mariscal to win. I think he outworks him. I think he might even close him out late. I, I said before this goes the distance, but I think Chepe Mariscal is very live for a third round finish. Give me Chepe to win this fight by knockout. Next, we have a fight between Yana Santos and Chelsea Chandler. You can make a case for Yana Santos. I would say that Santos is the more proven striker and has faced the better competition. Faced Chris Cyborg, Aspen Ladd, Irene Aldana, Holly home. The problem is she's getting smoked in these fights. So yes, you're fighting the better competition, but are you necessarily getting better as a result? I don't know because Chris Cyborg bombs on her, knocks her out in the first round. No shame in that. Where it starts to get dicey is she's winning against Aspen Ladd until Aspen Ladd finally decides to let her hands go. And the moment she does, she's out of there. Arena Aldana knocks her out in the first round. Holly Holm beats her every round and controls her for nearly 10 minutes of a 15 minute fight. So although she shared the cage with a lot of these better fighters, she hasn't really Really looked good. Now, she did look good recently against Carol Hosa. She looked much better than she has as of late. Lots of volume, decent accuracy, good work in the clinch, worked the body, just stayed busy. And that's how she can win this fight against Chelsea Chandler. If she just keeps making Chelsea Chandler work the entire time, I think Santos can edge out a decision. Now, on the other side, Chelsea Chandler just needs to get on top. If she can do that in this fight, she's going to win because we saw Santos struggle to get back up to her feet in prior fights. And Chelsea Chandler has the jujitsu advantage. We saw Chelsea Chandler do well against Josiana Nunes when she was able to get on top in the first two rounds. Where things get a little bit dicey, though, is the third round was a lot different. Chelsea Chandler couldn't take her down. It was getting beaten up standing, nearly finished at points. And she won that fight because she did enough in the first two rounds. But she was exposed on the feet. She looked uncomfortable. She looked reactive, as if she was waiting for Josiana Nunes to throw before she could, but not in like a counter striker kind of way and more of like a, oh, they just threw, so now I got to throw something and back kind of way. And she was enjoying a six inch reach advantage in that fight, but was still getting cleanly outstruck. And Josiana Nunes just kept catching her with these long reaching punches. And Santos is going to match up with her a lot better physically than we saw from Nunes. And she's surely going to outstrike her, I think most importantly in the clinch. We saw Norma Dumont make it look pretty easy against her in their fight. And while I don't think that Santos is Dumont level, I think she has the tools to win the minutes in this fight. I expect her to be the better fighter late. I think she's going to be fresher. I saw a social media post recently where she she said this is the best camp of her career and gave some reasons as to why. I know that's typical fighter and coach speak. This is the best training camp of my life. <laughs> and I know that's super cliche, but the things that she was pointing to in this post make me believe in what she's saying. I think she's going to come out here and look good. I think she's going to put it on Chelsea Chandler over three. And because we know Chelsea Chandler's going to fade, I think we have the third round in the bag if this fight goes the full three. So we just need one of the first two, or at least Yana Santos, to make it tough on the judges throughout those first two fights. And that's really what the last week's women's fights came down to is who's going
going to give you more in the final minutes of every round. I think Giannis Santos gives you more in the final minutes of these rounds. So give me the better experience, the better output. Give me Giannis Santos to win this fight by decision. And I quite like Jafel Filio from a betting standpoint, especially with the line. He probably finds himself on the official betting article this week. If you visit KunithMMA.com, go right up there to plans. You can grab yourself a total access package that's going to give you the official betting article of the week. You'll also get the DFS strategy guide, lineup optimizer, data model and projections, and access to the community tab. All of that can be found in the description and in a pinned comment. Best way to support the channel. And also like, subscribe, do all that good stuff. Back to the breakdown. Next, we have a fight between Carlampos Gigariu. He's fighting Toshiomi Kazama this week. The line might blow up for this fight by the time fight time rolls around. Time of recording this, Carlampos Gigariu currently around minus 190-ish. I would not be surprised if he ends up climbing quite a bit as people start to do their research and arrive at the same conclusion, which I think is the only conclusion. Toshiyami Kazama's not a UFC fighter. He's 1-3 in, in his last four, has been knocked out in all of those losses. He's 0-2 in the UFC, coming off of back-to-back first-round knockout losses. Prior to getting to the UFC, he did have success in these fights with his grappling. Granted, he wasn't fighting great competition. We just talked about gyms when we broke down the last fight, and I love the training situation, especially for this fight, for Giga Ryu. He's going to be way more prepared. I much prefer the bantamweight who shares a room with Marab and Aljamain Sterling over for a guy who lives and trains in Japan and might be the best fighter in his gym because he's the only one that's in the UFC. So I expect Gigariu to defend takedowns this week. I think he lands heavy shots right away, hurts Kazama early, probably finishes him shortly after. Give me Carlapos Gigariu to win this fight by knockout, probably in round one. Next we have a fight between Danny Barlow. He's getting a short notice replacement here with Nikolai Varetenikov. A lot to like about Danny Barlow and I saw Dan Levy make this comp. Dan Levy, friend of the show, check him out at best fight picks. He made this comp not too long ago. He said Danny Barlow is Jamal Hill. I love it. I agree with it because he's got great range, great power, natural hand speed, nice placement. And I could see Barlow winning a lot of fights in the UFC, knocking out a lot of guys in the process. We saw him finish Josh Quinlan last time out. Quinlan struggled to find his range, but he showed off that toughness. However, Barlow was able to get him out of there in the third round. Now, Danny Barlow was supposed to be fighting Uros Medic this week. I don't think that this fight gets any easier for him. I think Veritenikov is as good, if not better, than Uros Medic. Kind of feels like how Jordan Vucenic came in last week and scared everybody because he really put it on Guram Kutataladze in the first round. But Veritenikov is not bad. Fights at a King's MMA. Big dude. Strong guy for 170 pounds. If you go back and watch his fights, he's just looking bigger than his opponents. And not necessarily all that taller, but just bigger. And I liken it to Drickus Duplessis. You watch Drickus Duplessis fight and you're thinking like, Jesus, guy's huge. He looks massive in there, just thick, just wide. And I feel like that's what Veritenikov looks like against these recent opponents that he's had. And he's beating these guys. He's doing really well. He's finishing them. But respectfully, the dudes that he's getting matched up with, I think that Danny Barlow's knocking them out in 30 seconds. And I understand, like we talk a lot about these guys didn't fight nobody. The level of competition prior to the UFC was not good. It's hard for these guys to find good competition. The best fighters fight in the higher caliber organizations. So while you're making your way up to these higher caliber organizations, if you have UFC talent, if you have one championship talent, hell, even if you have PFL talent, you probably are smoking guys on the regional scene. And that's what Veritanikov has been doing. So he's winning fights and he should be winning them. He should be finishing them. So great. But I think that the Danny Barlow step up in competition will be too much. Danny Barlow knocks him out this week because as you look at moments where you watch Vertenikov fight and yes he's pounding these guys but he's also keeping his hands very low can't do that uh-uh no sir because you'll see that left hand to god coming right down the pipe we might see Vertenikov try to grapple in this one i think that if he gets on the ground he's going to have a little bit of success but he needs to cover a lot of distance in order to do that and that's where he's in trouble i see him eating a lot of shots on his way in i think that danny barlow intercepts him and you can't eat too many from a guy like this i think danny barlow wins by knockout next we have a fight between carol hosa and she's fighting panny kianza 
said, the favorites look good on this card, man. And last week, almost every favorite won. Hard to find value on a card like that unless you're hitting method of victories or you're an absolute chalk donkey, which sometimes it works out. This card does feel similar. And at first glance, I thought we had a live dog on our hands. I thought we had some value because I'm looking at this. I'm thinking Penny Kienzad might put it on her like in the clinch if she's throwing elbows or if she just makes it dirty. I think we can find a way to win for Penny. But then I looked back at Carol Hose's recent fight and I, I realized how happy I was about it. Carol Hoza was one of our output saviors when she first got into the UFC. No one wants to see low output MMA. We want to see action. And she was delivering on that. 171 significant strikes landed in her debut. 120 landed after that. 124 after that. But she went through a bit of a stretch where she had these fights where she just was not letting her hands go and it felt like nothing was happening. And in a Carol Hoza fight, that wasn't what we were accustomed to. So it was frustrating to see because you know what she can do. You watch that fight against Norma Dumont, extremely frustrating. Norma Dumont's having her way with her. She's letting minutes slip by against Dumont. She's letting the rounds slip by. And it's not until the third round where she really decides to put her foot on the gas is when she starts fighting and she's kicking Dumont's ass. Like if she gave even half of that effort in rounds one or two, she would have won. But what made me really happy to see is I'm going back and I'm like, okay, let me watch some Carol Hosa fights. Who'd she fight last? almost forgot about the Arena Aldana fight. They went to war. It was one of the best fights of 2023. If you haven't seen it, go watch it. She landed over 200 significant strikes in that fight. I think she's back. I think if she wants to throw a lot of strikes, she can. She can also take Panny Can's head down at any time and probably keep her there. She just has more ways to win. Double her up on the volume, take her down whenever you want, and lean on the jujitsu edge. There's so many ways that she can get it done. Give me the favorite this week. Give me the better output. Give me Carol Hosa to win this fight by decision. Really Real quick, if you haven't already, like the video, subscribe to the channel, comment something for the algorithm. You know how the algorithm works. It all goes a long way. Thank you very much. Next, we're looking at a fight between Carl Williams and Jonata Denise. Carl Williams, a grinder, a wrestler, something you don't see at the higher weight divisions often. And luckily for Williams, he's going to be fighting a kickboxer who's going to struggle to defend takedowns. So Williams is the favorite here, and rightfully so. Never been knocked out. Good cardio, good gym, huge wrestling edge. And if he wins this fight, it's going to look like one-way traffic. Now for Jonata Denise, I would argue that he wins every second that this fight is standing. And this is where I think things get a bit tricky because we've seen really good kickboxers have success in the higher weight divisions, even if they aren't good wrestlers or grapplers. And they do this by defending takedowns as best as they can. If they are taken down, they kind of hold, minimize damage, maybe stall until the end of the round. We saw that out of guys like Alex Pereira, Cesar Almeida, recently out of Jonata Denise when he fought Austin Lane. Lane takes him down. Down, holds him down for a lot of the first round, but he gets tired. And as soon as Denise got time and space to let his hands go, puts him out. We saw Carl Williams rocked by Justin Taffa and nearly finished multiple times. And we saw him go one for 10 on takedown attempts against Chase Sherman and was forced to strike and didn't look all that great on the feet. So if he does get stuck on the feet this week against the guy in Jonata Denise, he's done. He's getting put out. And I expect Williams to get takedowns here, but his control is not the best by any means. You know, Denise has been focusing on takedown defense more than anything during his training camp. And Carl Williams is as big a decisionator as you will find for a guy who spends so much time time in top position at the heavyweight division. No submissions, minimal ground and pound, just a lot of control and hustle and that works against these big boys, but I liken it to almost the Curtis Blades. He's a poor man's Curtis Blades in my opinion, where he's going to be able to wrestle effectively, but the striking is not there and he's going to get chinned at some point. Might not happen in this fight, might not happen in the next one, but eventually he's going to get knocked out and it's heavyweight MMA, it's going to happen. But we've seen him not respond all that well to power. He gets hit with power, he gets wobbly, he gets shaky legged and then he finds the clinch again he can fall right into the clinch Denise is a better finisher than anybody's ever seen a better striker than anybody's ever seen does he have as much raw power as Justin Taffa maybe not but can he put more than two punches together better than Justin Taffa can you bet your sweet bippy I expect Denise to catch him in the in-betweens land a combination and get Williams out of there giving him his first UFC loss so give me the dog give me the kickboxer give me the Brazilian give me Jonata Denise to win this fight by now out. Next, we have a fight between Yusuf Salal fighting Jarno Ahrens as an ambassador of the Yusuf Salal fan club. I'm telling you now, our boy gets it done again. He's a big favorite. It's no surprise. But Jarno Ahrens coming off of his first UFC win looked better than ever. Fast on the feet, showed off some durability, busting Steven Wynn up. And if you're standing right in front of this guy, he's going to give you a lot of problems. He's going to look good. Yusuf Zalal, not standing right in front of you, brother. Zalal is historically very hard to hit, absorbing less than two significant 
strikes per minute. On top of that, he's going to have the wrestling edge in this fight, and he's going to grapple a lot. We saw him have a lot of success grappling in his UFC return against Billy Quarantillo. Took his back, choked him out in the second round, and I think the current version of Yusuf Zalal is going to be a problem for a lot of guys at 145 pounds. I think he makes it look easy this week to Jarno Aarons, who's rocking a 28% takedown defense. Aarons has no offensive wrestling of his own, which has given Yusuf Zalal some trouble in the past, but even if they were to just strike for most of this. I still would think that Yusuf Zalal gets it done, beats him to the punch, and lands cleaner strikes and sits him down maybe more than once. Aarons hasn't been finished in the UFC, but I think that changes here this week. Give me Yusuf Zalal to win this fight inside the distance. And lastly, we have a fight between Talita Allen Carr. She's fighting Stephanie Luciano this week. A rematch from a fight that happened on Contender Series ended in a draw. Allen Carr leaned on that jujitsu that she has. She was able to get the first two rounds under her belt, but gassed and gassed hard in the third round. Luciano really put it on her. That fight really could have been stopped. 10 eights across the board. And Allen Carr was a pretty big favorite in that one. And now the line has flipped in the rematch. And it makes sense. It's hard to argue after what the last five minutes of that first fight looked like. And you look at Allen Carr's first fight in the UFC, it shows as a win could have went either way, but it was against Rayani Dos Santos, who's no good. Very low fight IQ. She went one for nine on takedown attempts in that fight and lost on the striking numbers. She gets the nod in that fight, but she probably should have lost. And even in the first fight against Lucindo, she went four for 24 on takedown attempts, which is why she gassed. And with Lucindo having the size advantage, big old reach advantage, as you can see there on the screen, the youth and the confidence that she can pull from the way the last fight ended, I think that she knocks Alan Carr out this time around. I don't think Alan Alan Carr is going to hang around for all three rounds. We're going to see a lot of grappling from Alan Carr in this fight, and I have no reason to believe that she's not going to gas out. I think Luciano just makes her work. Defense takedowns, when she is taken down, gets back up to her feet, keeps volume in her face. So give me the length, give me the youth, give me the gas tank, give me the better striker, and I think she closes her out this time. Give me Stephanie Luciano to win this fight by knockout. If you've made it to this point in the video, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. Make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, comment something for the algorithm, and I'll see you later in the week for final picks. Let's go.